Hello folks, I am here today with Lisa Erlandson, who is one of our Thrive Programme consultants. And I know that some of you may know a little bit about how Lisa came to be a Thrive consultant, but I don't think anyone knows the full story. So this little interview come chat with my colleague here is going to be entitled My Worst Client Ever. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. You're okay. <laughs> and Lisa genuinely was, uh, no longer, was my worst client ever. If I ever was going to have a Thrive Programme client that I genuinely thought for the first time since developing the programme, crikey, maybe this is the one that will get away, maybe this is the one that it won't work for, maybe this is the one that's just got so many issues, so many problems, thinking is all over the place, maybe this is the one it won't work for. If I was ever going to think that way about a client, then it would have been Lisa. Uh, but I didn't think that way. So, I've known Lisa for about four years now, and Lisa was passing through Cambridge one day when my clinic was and said, look, you know, uh, um, I've got a metaphobia, can I come and see you? And that basically carried on for about three and a half years. Uh, did you add up how many sessions we actually had? Well, the ones we clocked, I'm not, I'm not sure you should admit it on tape, just whisper it to me. How many, how many times did we actually have? How many? Yeah. 14? No, no, no. Okay. Those yeah, only I, I ones. thought you said 40. <laughs> no. 14, okay. So a lot of sessions, twice as many as you know, a, a kind of normal average client needs. But the problem we had was that Lisa would have a session and then I wouldn't see her for three or four months. And she'd go up and down like, oh, yeah, yeah, she'd get a bit better, she'd get a bit worse, blah, blah, blah. And then I'd see her again, then I'd see her again. And I know for a fact that she bought at least four emetophobia books off me, because I know every single person was in it. Was it four you had? Three, I think. Okay. Why yeah. Why did you need three? Why three books? Well, the first one wasn't an emetophobia book. It was the Thrive. It was before the proper emetophobia one was actually out. Okay. So we're probably looking at almost actually five Ish okay. years ago. Was that the Changing Limited Beliefs book? No, no, it was Thrive, Okay. but it wasn't a metaphobia specific. Okay. So I'd gone through that one, scribbled in it. Uh, I hadn't really committed to the programme at that point. Like I wanted to be well, but I had a lot going on in my life and I didn't really apply myself at all. Okay. Uh, and so I must have had like three sessions, I think, and then that was it. I just, I couldn't really take the time off work to come see you and I, I sort of... I didn't really think about it. So then when I start when I contacted you eighteen months later, year eighteen months, to get started again, you gave me a fresh copy of the new emetophobia book and I okay. did it as a fresh start. Okay. And how many of those did you have? Probably three okay. of them. Yeah. So so four books in total. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the reasons you needed uh, three versions of that book was because she wrote and underlined and highlighted so much within that book that the book was falling apart and she had to get a new one each time. Is that right? Okay, so this isn't a person that didn't read the book. Um, this is a person who understood the programme very, very well, having had 14 sessions, I think it was probably ever so slightly higher than that. Well, that was just the ones we recorded that were face-to-face. -face. All right, okay, that excludes... Not the Skype, the telephone calls. Hundreds of phone conversations, yeah. okay. Um, <clears throat> so, um, basically, we got, we, we got to the point where it was becoming obvious that what Lisa was doing was that she intellectually understood the programme, but she just wasn't doing it. Now, more often than not, I, I, no, I, I regularly find myself answering emails and texts and this kind of stuff from people on the programme, and they say things like, oh, I've read the book twice, I've read the book three times, I know better. Well, reading the book's going to have no impact whatsoever. It's a training programme. Reading the book, understanding the book, understanding the programme tells you what to do in order to learn to thrive, and in this case overcome emetophobia, but you have to put in the work, you have to do the exercises and the actions, you have to live and breathe thriving in order to get thriving. Reading the book is going to have no effect at all. So I said to Lisa, uh, in a moment of exasperation, <laughs> uh, I said to her, look, if you are not over this by next April, was it April or February? 
April. I isn't? think you said February, March, and we booked it in for April. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I said to her, you know, if you want to over this, excuse me, by next, whenever it was, March, April, which was three years ago, um, you are going to come and live with me for a week, and I will do a one-person boot camp just for you, and I will beat this thing out of you. <clears throat> And um, needless to say, she carried on putting in effort a few days, not putting in effort, being in a good mood, being in a bad mood, having a blip up and down like a bloody roller coaster. So in the end, uh, Lisa came to effectively live with me for a week or, or, or come and stay at the house for a week and do a week-long boot camp. Now, she turned up on the Sunday night and within about three and a half days, she was completely over her emetophobia completely gone okay is there any semblance of metaphobia left no now people won't believe that okay like they don't believe it when they see mary's or laura's or katie's or these other videos right people say oh she's making it up she's exaggerating you you are no longer fighting thousands of thoughts a day about the worry of being sick no okay it's not just that you've got good at fighting them no it's nothing to fight now so how i'm never good at fighting them anyway so how often each day are you still having those horrible thoughts? Not at all. How often are you... You saw me when I made a cup of cup of tea or a cup of coffee <laughs> this morning in your kitchen with milk. That I, I didn't even check the date because I don't do that anymore. And I went to pour this milk out without thinking and a big sludge of gone off gloop came out. Which I thought was really funny. So I just poured it down the sink. Turns out you had some UHT in the fridge. Which I, I, have, seen, I, I but... want to say for the purpose of the camera, I'm normally... <laughs> Uh, I'm a little bit uh, more fastidious about my uh, um, looking after the fridge. I think but it was a test. Yeah, that's what it was. It was a <laughs> test. But you, you, you don't have any safety-seeking or avoidance behaviours at all. You are as free of, from a worry of being sick as the next man. Yeah. Okay. So, and it's important to people to realise that you can completely get over it. And that's what we're aiming for with the Thrive Programme of Metaphobia. We're not aiming to get people 50% better, 60, 80, 90. And there's a good reason for that, just on, on that note. Because your metaphobia is a symptom of your beliefs and your thinking styles, and not the other way around. Okay? You have a metaphobia because you have an external sense of power and control, because you have a strong desire for control, because you're obsessive, you're a perfectionist, you have disgust, propensity, all these things. Your metaphobia is a symptom of your beliefs and thinking styles, not the other way around. So it's only when you change your beliefs and your thinking styles that you'll be able to overcome your metaphobia. So if you only get over it 50 or 60 or 70%, that basically means you've only changed 30 or 40 or 50% of your beliefs and thinking styles. Now chances are, when the stress and pressure is on you in life, you're only gonna recreate metaphobia again, mm -hmm. which is why you see on all the other emetophobia forums that people tend to drift in and out of it and it gets really bad and not so bad, okay? It's because you, you're not over it, you, you, you're managing to control it a little bit better. We want to get you completely over it, and you can do, and it's relatively easy. Now, I want to jump a couple of years, we'll come back to jump a couple of years. It's now the Thrive Programme Conference last year, mm -hmm. and you did a little talk and I was doing a little talk, and you said to me once, or maybe it wasn't a conference, but you said to me once, um, why didn't you give up on me, Rob? Why didn't you just tell me to get lost? Why didn't, why didn't you ever say to me, you know, because we must have had a hundred phone calls during that three or four years, as well as numerous sessions, about 14 recordings. There's probably 20 sessions, hundreds of emails on a number of occasions, getting calls from Lisa, in tears, incredibly stressed, blah, 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 blah. Okay, why didn't I ever tell her to, why didn't I ever let her down gently and say, do you know what, Lisa, maybe this isn't for you. Maybe you should do something else. Maybe you should go for psychotherapy. Maybe you've got a, a more deeply rooted uh, issue problem. Maybe you should do family therapy. Maybe you should do something else. Why, why didn't I ever say that? So when you ask me, Rob, why didn't you, kick me out why didn't you say sorry we're done why didn't you say you must need some other treatment what was my answer you said because I always knew I always knew that if if you did the book properly you would get over it and I 100% knew that okay so th that's exactly what I said 
So I absolutely knew, as much as I know that if I throw this wonderful Thrive coaster up in the air, it's going to hit the ground again. I absolutely believe in gravity. I absolutely know it's going to happen. I absolutely know that this program will work for anybody with emetophobia if they do it correctly, if they do it properly. Um, and I also know that there's no other cure for emetophobia other than the Thrive Program. Nothing anywhere near as predictable anyway. So I also know that if I had said to Lisa, look, you know, sorry, I suggest you go and try something else. I would actually be letting her down badly, knowing that this was the most likely thing to help her change her life. So I just always knew, I never shouted at her, I never screamed at her, even though I felt like doing that on occasion, <laughs> even though I may have raised my voice a couple of times, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I never did, because I always knew that sooner or later she would get it. So I guess, without, yeah, without sounding patriarchal, I, it's a little bit like a parent watching their child, their, their toddler, learn to walk. You never as a parent think, oh my God, this kid's never gonna walk. He's gonna be crawling till he's 15 years old, be crawling to university. You always know that sooner or later, they're just gonna get it, it's gonna click one day. I absolutely knew that for Lisa. And so I, 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 I didn't just leave her uh, um, or refer her on something else. I absolutely knew that she'd get it. And I also knew that once she'd got it, she would get over it very quickly. So when she did come to stay, for a week-long boot camp, she was over her emetophobia halfway through it. And as you can see and hear, completely over it, completely emetophobia free. Now, if you go to the NHS, which is the health service we have in the UK, and you see the top psychologists in the country, they will tell you it's impossible to overcome emetophobia. They will tell you that all we can do is try to help you live with it. But this is the problem with the psychological services, particularly in the UK, and in the States, is that it's only ever focused on trying to get you to live with it because they don't understand the problem and they certainly don't understand how you can get to the point where you can cure somebody or where somebody can cure themselves because of course I didn't do it to Lisa, Lisa did it to herself. So, I realise I'm doing all the talking. What, in hindsight Lisa, looking back now, what were the, uh, I know what I think, but what were the major issues that were just stopping you from getting over? Mm. I think the first one was that I, I genuinely didn't believe it would work. Okay. Or didn't believe that I could make it work. Either one. So okay. my perspective on it was always that it wouldn't work. And because of that, what happened? You put in my, less effort. Yeah, well, like, well, no, I would put in effort, but it would be it would be really concentrated effort over a period of a few days. Okay. I might start to slowly feel better, but I wouldn't necessarily attribute that to the effort. Okay. I might have one bad day, and catastrophize the whole thing. Um, it, it in my head that was all the evidence I needed. It was not going to work, and I would stop putting effort in, go completely downhill and then wait a little while before I got back in touch with you to say... Mm, OK, so struggling. as a Thrive Consultant, you've now helped enough emetophobes yourself yeah. to know that they all do that, right? Yeah. They all have a blip or numerous blips. They catastrophize that blip. Yeah. They go really, really bad for a few days, probably worse than they ever were before. Mm -hmm. So why do they? Why did you stop putting in effort just because you had a blip? Why didn't you just think, that's only a blip and work through it? I was being very hard on myself, and okay. I don't think I noticed that in a voice. But but I think for a really long time I wasn't seeing that I was creating this. I still thought it was happening to me. Okay. And so my first day of boot camp, you got out your bricks, all the Lego bricks. Yeah. And you assembled them together to show me that you know these are the twenty six thinking styles behaviours that cause emetophobia, and you've got all of them, and this is this one, this is this one, this is this one. And that, that suddenly, I realised it was logical and predictable. And then when I looked back on all the blips and on all the ups and downs and feeling good and feeling bad, it was tying so much into all those thinking okay. styles. Okay. So the moment it made sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've talked recently on various videos and in updates in the book and things like this. 
that I think the hardest thing for anyone with any phobia to get, even if you're just afraid of a spider, and if you're if you're if I'm terrified right now of that spider over there, one automatically assumes if I'm terrified, then that must be terrifying, because why else am I terrified? And of course that's how someone with an external sense of power and control, external local control thinks. They think that things outside are affecting them. So if I see a spider and I'm terrified, that spider must be terrifying, I go do a runner. Hmm. The moment I realise it's not the spider that's terrifying, it's me that's creating this anxiety about the spider, I can do something about it. Yeah. But that is also, as we were chatting earlier, a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because not only now do I feel completely empowered that you know this is not happening to me. I, I can, and I'm doing this to myself. I can get over this. It also puts immense responsibility on me because I realise now I'm the only person that can help myself. Yeah, and I've never really had that kind of responsibility, total responsibility over myself before. And in some senses, I didn't like it very much. I, di I didn't have enough self belief to believe that I could do it. So when I found out that I was actually that this anxiety wasn't unpredictable and I was creating it, and I could stop it, yes, that was great, but also that was then my responsibility, yeah. and I wasn't sure that I wanted that, or that yeah. I could do it. Okay. So I was a bit, like, a bit wobbly at that point, okay. I think. Okay, okay. So what did we do um, in those three, three and a half days? What was the difference? Why did, why did that work? I know what I think, I'll let you answer it first of all. Why did that work? And you've been, I know you had one blip, didn't you, five or six months after when you moved house to Bournemouth. Yeah. First time you'd ever lived on your own in Bournemouth. Yeah. Of course you're going to feel sad and lonely and in the middle of nowhere. Mm. Your mood went down for a little bit and you had a little bit of a blip then, but as soon as you realised what it was, you overcame it. Apart from that, you've been, you were completely cured, cured yourself in those three days and you've never looked back since. And that was, what, three years ago now? Yeah, two, three years ago two, now. Two, three years ago, yeah. okay. So, why then? Everyone wants to know, how did you do it in those three, three and a half days? In the three days. Um, quite a few things, I think. Okay. I think I couldn't get away with not doing the work because I was here. Okay. And you knew I understood the programme and that I wasn't doing it. Okay. So, you made me do the exercises regularly. We set timers on my phone. Um, we had a structure and a predictability, I had to get up, do certain things, etc, etc. So you, you forced me to do things and you made me very conscious of my inner voice. I don't think at that point I'd realised just how much bad thinking was swirling around here. And I think you made me very aware of it. But I think probably the biggest thing was that when I got here, you shut off my phone. Come back to that in one second, OK, because that was my main point, OK? Yeah. So... We have somewhere in the region of 50,000 thoughts a day, right? Yeah. So if we get up at 8 and we go to bed at 10, that's about one thought every second, okay? In hindsight, what percentage of your day-to-day -day thinking was directly or indirectly related to emetophobia? I reckon at least 50, 50 60% directly. Okay. And probably another 30% indirect because it was all the... Um, the stuff that was tying into feeling powerless, the stuff that was the, the thinking that was um, fueling my really low self esteem, okay. you know, the grief I was giving myself every time I was. All wasn't the safety there. seeking, the avoidance yeah. behaviours, they're Everything. all wholly negative. Okay. So even conservatively, then 80%. Yeah. Okay. At least. So 80% of 50,000, right, is 45,000 thoughts. Okay. Yeah. So you went from having 45,000 powerless, catastrophic, frightening thoughts um, about being sick, yeah. okay, to having next to none mm -hmm. straight away in one day. Yeah, 45,000 thoughts a day to having no catastrophic thoughts. Well, I think the first day we noticed them. Okay. And after that, second and third day was not creating them anymore. And, and we set timers, so yeah. you check your thinking every 20 minutes. We didn't allow you, did we, to fall back into thinking and brooding and recreating it. So I, I think, for, for, for my best guess, uh, what I thought would happen, uh, um, and the reason we said come on a, a boot camp, is because I knew that I could control the amount of external influences mm. into Lisa's life, which <clears> you touched on, as you can talk about in a minute, 
Um, I, I could <coughs> shut them out, very unhelpful external influences, but also I knew if I kind of managed her training diary for her, that I could get her, you know, it wasn't hard work. You know, it wasn't that you didn't thrive all day, every day. Some days we, we went to the pub. Uh, um, another day we went for flying the aeroplane. Another day we went to see my friend in the next village and got you to climb a tower. You know, Even did other that little was things. more than I was doing on my own because you were forcing me to get out and do things that okay. took me out of my own head and I wasn't doing that. Okay. And that was part of the reason why I did have a blip when I moved to Bournemouth because I'd moved away from all my friends in a flat on my own. I didn't have any hobbies yet. I had a job that was nine to five and quite predictably nine to five. And I, I walked home afterwards. So I, I got home by 20 past five every day and I had nothing to occupy myself between then and bedtime. Okay. So reiterating the same point, and I apologise, 45,000 unhelpful thoughts a day. On day one, perhaps down to 30,000 mm -hmm. thoughts a day. On day two, 20,000 thoughts a day. By day three, 10,000, which is next to nothing compared to 45,000. And of course, if you're having 10,000 unhelpful thoughts a day, you're probably having 40,000 very helpful thoughts a day. So very, very quickly, mm -hmm. your powerful positive uh, internal thoughts became far greater than your negative powerless external thoughts and it just beat this thing to a pulp. Yeah and we did a lot of work on processing that properly and that I think that was another big thing that I was making this progress where possibly when I had done that before I would not have even if I'd noticed it I maybe wouldn't have processed it brilliantly okay whereas being here you were making it so obvious how much progress I was making, how different each what, day was. And what she means by that is every time Lisa got a bit better or felt a bit better, ordinarily she, she wouldn't necessarily oh, I'm feeling better now, and not necessarily know. I would say to her, how are you feeling better? Why are you feeling? Because if you were feeling only 8 out of 10 half an hour ago, and now you're feeling 9 out of 10, you're feeling great, what have you done in that half an hour to make herself feel better. So this was getting her over, again, the externality and the helplessness of, I don't know why I feel good sometimes or bad sometimes. I don't know why my emetophobia is worse today. I don't know why it's worse in summer. I don't know why it's worse here. I don't know why it's better there. Getting her to realise, well, look, if, I've, if I'm feeling better in half an hour and life doesn't happen to me, I've done something to myself in the last half an hour to make myself feel better. Well, what have I done? Look back and oh, I've done this. And I've done that and I experienced that. And I processed it properly and I'm making that sticky in my mind. So the next time she feels a little bit low, instead of just feeling powerless, and oh my God, I don't know what to do, life is terrible. She thinks, hang on, what did I do last time? Looks back in her diary, oh, I did this, I'm gonna do that again. And that's how you help someone to overcome learned helplessness. They're learning a skill set. Yeah. Learned helplessness brings us back to the point you made a minute ago. Oh. where you said that, you know, on day one, I took your phone away from you. So, just as a little uh, preamble to this then, I had noticed, and Lisa and I had had numerous conversations over the years during our sessions, that almost every single time she had a big blip, it's when she'd either spoken to or spent some time with her significant other, which in Lisa's case was her mum. Now, what I want to say before we talk about this is... I'm absolutely certain that 99% of mums are just normal, loving, caring mums. I'm a father that you want to do the absolute best by your children and you, you, know, you don't want to see them hurt, you don't want to see them cry, you don't want to see them upset, you only ever want to see them happy and successful. And when you've got that in a parent that's got a strong desire for control themselves, you can end up over-controlling your child's life. Now... If you, if you already have that kind of disposition, if you've already got a strong desire for control yourself, and then you've got a child, as Lisa was as a young girl, full of anxiety, and you feel very protective, you end up doing lots and lots to protect and, and, uh, and mentor and nurture and care for and rescue your child, which in a way is lovely, but in another way is awful, because what you end up with is creating a completely powerless young lady and a young teenager who's got no skill sort of her own 
by the time she gets to 13, 14, 15, she feels completely powerless because mum's never let her do anything in order to learn these skills, is my interpretation of it. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think it, I always remember you saying when I first came to see you that I had a really, really unusual relationship with a mum for someone aged 25, 26. I was still depending on her like a teenager. And, and I needed to ring her at least once a day, if not more. And then between that, we would text each other. And every time I needed her, I would reach out and I knew she'd be there straight away, which was good in some senses, but I also never learned to be independent. Or if I was independent, it was always with my parents waiting in the wings to rescue me if something wasn't going right. And we know that social anxiety often plays a big part in emetophobia, particularly because of the perfectionism and low self-esteem. Yeah. So, as you were closest to your mum more than anyone in the world, you're like twins, the two of you, the moment she said anything that you perceived as judgmental, you had a major blip. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I think in the early days of Thrive, that actually got slightly worse before it got better because my mum was still responding to me, and she'd always responded to me, as you would. She wasn't going through Thrive herself, I was. I wasn't really sharing a lot with her about the process and what I was learning. So you know now that we, that, you know, if we, if we take any girl or boy who's still living at home through the Thrive Programme for Metaphobia, we, we always now take the mum or dad through as well, or at least yeah. get them to read the book. Why didn't your mum read the book, at least? Um... I know we talked about it a little bit, but I I don't think she'd ever made the connect in terms of how her behaviour might affect my progress through Thrive. Okay. And so, so she, she so she, she saw it. it her... She saw it that my daughter's got this problem. She yeah. didn't see that it could be connected at all with the way you were being brought up or the way you were being supported or anything like that. No, and I I think. In, from her perspective, she just wanted, she just wanted me to get better. But it, but it, essentially, it was my thing. It was I was going for sessions. I was going for help. I was keeping it quite private, and I don't think she needed felt like she needed to be involved in that okay. in any way, shape, and or of form. And of course, you've been for lots and lots of help prior to coming to the thrive. Program. Yeah, which hadn't hadn't really done anything and left me feeling more helpless, which had meant mm. I'd run back to them again. Um, so I think there was potentially an expectation from my mum that maybe this wasn't working. So if I if I had a bad day where obviously I would reach she out would to her. She would panic and overreact. She would panic that it wasn't working. I think she might have emailed you at one point. Um, what did I say to her? Couldn't discuss, you know, I was over the age of 18. You couldn't even acknowledge that I was a client, you know. So that so there's no there was no shame. I wasn't, I wasn't more robust than that, no? No, I think that was, that was a pretty good summary. Okay. <laughs> did I not threaten you once to kick you out of the programme unless you stop talking to your mum. Yeah. I think well, I, you didn't I, say stop talking, but you said limit the contact. Limit the contact because I pointed out to you that every time you had a blip, it's because of something to do with you and mum. And I just said to you, just give yourself three or four weeks with limited contact, okay? You'd stop blipping. You'd have a tremendous amount of progress. You'd, you'd get that insight and you'd get better. And that's the reason why I said in the end, Mm. come to see me for a boot camp. So the day the day she turned up on the Sunday night, I took her mobile phone off her and I said, you, you're not going to speak to your mum for three days or, or a week or something. It was a week in the end. And I even limited your contact to your boyfriend, didn't I? Yeah. Even though he was very thriving and helpful, mm. we wanted just to make sure that for a few days only, I only had you for a week, mm. for a few days only, you were only doing thrivy stuff. Yeah, because... He was also a significant other in a way, in a more slightly more helpful way, but I was always reaching out to him all day long for support and encouragement, support and encouragement, and I needed that at the time to feel like I was doing well, and you needed to strip away all that external stuff, because whilst that was still happening, I was still feeling either really helpless or only acknowledging progress when my significant others were going, yeah, you're doing really well, you're doing really well. Okay, so when you when you were going through it and you were making significant progress, mm -hmm. a part of that had to be you kind of growing up in relation to your relationship with your mum. So n not being that twenty four year old, acting like a fifteen year old in that relationship mm -hmm. anymore, and you were pulling away. 
what was her reaction when you were pulling away and being more independent? Excuse me. Being more independent, not calling her every day. What was her reaction to that? It was quite a messy, turbulent year, I think, before we adjusted to it. It was, it was like my entire teenage dom condensed into a year of growing up. Okay. Uh, Did you say teenage dom? Yeah. Okay. That's all right. That's a thing. We'll, we'll, we'll keep a it. Word. We'll keep That's it. That's fine. Right, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, like teenage. That. Teenage. Um, and so I think what was happening is she was still reacting to me the way she'd always reacted to me. That, you know, she'd had 25 years of her life of treating me a certain way and it had always worked up to that point. Um, protecting started, and caring. Yeah, protecting, looking after yeah. me, rescuing. I'd played into that by always ringing her when I needed anything and always asking her advice and always... You know, she had a huge role in everything in my life. And when I stepped back from that to be more independent, that was quite a huge change for the family. But I think she was still reacting to me as old Lisa, as old be behaviours. Because she didn't understand Thrive, she hadn't yeah. read the book. She didn't quite know what progress I was making and, and yeah. hadn't gone through anything about blips. So when I had a bad day, she believed it wasn't working. Working. She believed that you know she needed to come and help me again. She just wanted to die straight in a rescue. She wanted to help. She she couldn't. She didn't like seeing me on the bad days because the no. bad days were bad. Um, and so we had a lot of highs and lows. And I have to say now that the relationship with all of my family is better than it's ever been. Like hundred times better than it's ever been. We have a really solid family unit now. But there was an adjustment phase going no. through Thrive. I, I think my dad read the book um, and, and did, and I think he... Didn't he, he secretly read the book? I think he secretly read the book. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure when he told my mum he'd read the book. Okay. But I, I, don't, I don't think it was intentionally behind her back, but I think he just took it in his rucksack on the train and he would read okay. it on his commute because he kind of wanted to understand... He could start to see progress, but he wanted to know why that was happening. Okay. And so he started to learn how the thinking was playing into it and actually he's implemented some of Thrive himself at work and is finding that he's a lot better in the workplace and more positive and more proactive and independent and that okay. kind of stuff. So, thank you for that. In hindsight then, yeah. that four year journey, yeah. right, could have, you know, in, if, if you knew then what you know now, what would you have done differently? Ooh. Would it Would it have still taken you a long time? Technically, no. My, my current mindset is that I don't want to regret anything because there's no point. Okay. Everything in my journey brought me to a point where I've managed to implement Thrive so fully and have a really fantastic life that I wouldn't change my journey. Uh, that, However, that's wonderful, right? However. I am already bald, okay, from the stress of taking you through this yeah. programme, okay? And there are eight and a half million... <laughs> emetophobes in America alone, right? I do not want to take them all through four years worth of this. Well, I, I could take them a good three and a half years of it. Okay. Um, okay, so I, I think firstly, I could have done the book on my own had I actually applied it properly. Okay, you could have done it just with a book? Yes, okay. I could have had I done it properly. Okay. Uh, I never did that. Okay. I very much cherry-picked the exercises that I, I read it, underlined it, highlighted it, made notes, read all the research papers at the back. Not that I had a high desire for control or anything, but but uh, I, I did all that side of it and I thought reading the book would cure me. Okay. And and so my reaction to not getting better was to consistently just reread the book okay. and, and, and not implement. I would implement some exercises but not the ones I didn't want to do or that were too difficult or that challenged me too much. Um, so, in that mindset, with that approach, I couldn't do the book. But had I actually applied myself and believed that it would work and that I could do it, I could have done the book myself. Okay. I think that would be my my next point. Was that I was I was so convinced it wouldn't work, and for a long time resisted changing that. And rather than using that kind of energy helpfully to go onto the Thrive website and watch the testimonials and believe I could do it, I was going onto the website to watch the testimonials, read the testimonials, and give myself a hard time for not having done it as quickly as okay. them, for not having done it as well as them. And, and that just 
hindered me. It was a waste of time and energy for a programme that I so wanted to work but refused to believe would okay. for a long time. And you refused to believe it, why? Because you were so bad? Because you were so helpless? Very helpless. So... In, ter in terms of your clients that you've now seen, you've helped over emetophobia, hmm. do you see that your level of helplessness was lower than average, was the same? Um, slightly higher than most. Okay. Pro well, I mean, I think you'd probably argue quite a lot higher than most. But, but I mean, it depends, because everyone's different. I've had a, a few clients that have been close to my level of helplessness. Um, There's quite often an, a, an interfering parent, isn't there? It, mm -hmm. a, a, you know, I'm sure they're doing it for the right reasons, but they're so used to rescuing and controlling and wanting to help. I think the, that the they're, not, they're not giving they're not giving the child any space at all to kind of grow or, or fall over. You know, you get, some of these parents put put knee pads on their boys. Right, so that when they fall over and they're playing, they don't hurt the knees. Mm. They're not allowing them to hurt their knees to realise how not to do it next time. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I've definitely found that it's sometimes been the parents that are more um, frightened of the failure than actually the child is. Okay. That um, it's the parents recognising the blips maybe is worse than the child is. And, and the blips are expected as you go through the programme. But I never really hear it as badly from the client than as I do from the parent right, worrying okay. that the blip is a signal so that the that's parent, it. So the parent might phone the week and say, oh, she's having a terrible week, it's awful. Yeah. When you see the client, no, it's all right. I had a good... Yeah. Okay. So, but, so we, all, we already know, don't we, that the, the thinking styles the emetophobe has and the beliefs have, they, they basically copy off one or both of their parents yeah. anyway. So it's not surprising then that a lot of the time mum's obsessive, a perfectionist, a catastrophizer, etc, etc. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think every single one, it's always been coming from a really good place and I will always emphasise that with the parents, that um, they just want the child to be better. Yeah. They just don't want the child to suffer with it anymore. Yeah. And that's exactly what my mum had. But the problem is that there has to be a little bit of of not rock bottoms but a little bit of knee grazing as you put it along yeah. the way in order to go up it's not a straight line. Well, to be given a bit of space. Yeah and what would be uh, you know as as officially the worst client ever? <laughs> Do I, I get a badge? Please don't email me in saying that <laughs> that she's not that there are there are others she definitely was the worst <laughs> client ever. You do get a badge. Um so but you know and now I'm a consultant so that just shows you. And you're completely over it, 100% yeah, over it. Yeah, 100%. So I, th I think, uh, I w uh, without putting pressure on, I, I think you could have done it in six weeks like yeah. anyone like Mary did, like anyone can. But uh, not to comfort and protect you, in your defence, uh, um, that collusive, significant other relationship that you had, I don't remember ever seeing one as strong as that. Mm. I don't remember, I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, the fact that you just would not recognise or accept in any way, shape or form that your emetophobia might be something to do with that relationship. That, and that's why you wouldn't reduce the contact or, or put in effort to change the dynamic in the relationship. Only when you started to do that, when you heard your inner voice and that's due to that old crikey, and only when I basically took your phone off you and gave you a couple of days where you kind of withdrew from that, you could put the effort in and you started to get over your learned helplessness. Like we see in the Seligman experiment, where they take the puppy from the, the side of the cage where it's getting the shocks. How do you get a puppy over the helplessness? You drag it to the side of the cage where it's not getting shocked, mm. put it back again and see what it does. If it still doesn't escape by itself, you put it back again and you drag it over and that's effectively what we do with you. You are a puppy, you were a puppy, continually getting shocked, and just looking around, thinking there's nothing I can do about it. And we kept dragging you out of it, and then putting you back, and eventually you got it. Yeah. And I, I think somewhere along the line, my expectations weren't at the right level. I think I thought that when I stepped away from that relationship, I would feel absolutely fine straight away. And yet I had depended on my parents in an incredibly high way for 25, 26 years of my life. 
and it was really uncomfortable mm. when I was here and you took my phone away and I didn't like it and probably had I not been here I would have gone running back yeah which is probably why well we I've see got it this here. we were talking about this a couple of weeks back this is why as part of the Thrive Programme we don't nor will we ever run an online chat forum mm. because you know we, we've seen it a lot with the metaphobes the moment they feel under pressure, the moment they feel they're having a little blip they immediately kick off and reach out for support from other metaphobes or family and friends which on the one hand is incredibly helpful and supportive but on the other hand it's just completely keeping them in that vulnerable learned helpless state they need to be left to get grazers on their knees to figure out how to stand on their own two feet mm. if every time they feel threatened or anxious they reach out and get someone else to pull them out of it they are never going to learn the skills to do that themselves yeah and i didn't realize just how much that was feeding the belief that i was powerless i didn't see the connect at yeah. all that the fact that i was 25 26 years old and i needed to ring my mum x number of times a day and if she didn't answer i was going to get really anxious i didn't see that that connected to the fact that i was really powerless and that i felt that without my parents there i could not cope could you not see that what do you know? Those glasses work. Do you see those glasses? They're a bit smeary. But... Okay, okay. <laughs> the good news is obviously that uh, you did get it. Yeah. And the moment you got it, bang, it fitted mm. like, a, like a one fits all shoe. Yeah. You got it straight away, and within a few days you got over it. Now, uh, I'm not talking about that to put pressure on other metaphobes to say, look, you know, Lisa did it in three days, anyone can. Lisa didn't do it in three days, Lisa did it in four years. Um, her learning took four years. She put effort in over three days. Mm. Um, but you did know the programme inside out. You just hadn't done it because you felt helpless. Mm. You know, there's, there's an obesity epi epidemic in the UK at the moment. 13 or 15 million obese adults in the UK. And kind of nothing wrong with the vast majority of them. They know how to eat properly. They know how to lose weight. Mm. Um, but they just don't do it because they feel helpless. It's the yeah. same thing, isn't it? Now, I remember when I started here, you got me to write a list of five things that I stuck next to the bed. And it was, you know, five things I would say when I got up in the morning to set my head straight for the day. And it was stuff I'd never said when I got up before. Like, you can do it. You know, I'm going to put the effort in. I'm going to think. Well, you know, all this stuff. But helpless people don't think Yeah, like I that. never had thought like that. It was such a flick. It was, it was such a change for me. It's interesting, mindset. isn't it? If you think about it, someone with a large degree of learned helplessness mm. never ever thinks, I can do this. They would mm. think, my mum could help me do this. My boyfriend could help me through this. My friends will help me support me through this. They don't think, I could do this. Mm. Just like the puppy in the box never thinks, I can get out of this. Mm. So that was, I think, was an incredibly important part of you learning to thrive. Yeah. And you are thriving. Yeah. You are thriving. Yeah, and what the amazing thing was, was once I actually felt in control of my life, I built a brilliant life. Of course you did. Where I'm Why so, wouldn't you? so busy that I don't, you know, I don't have time to brood and worry anyway, not that I do, but I'm, you know, I've got actual, you know, hobbies and friends and things to do and I'm running a business. Friends. And friends, actual friends. You're not just saying that for the camera. I am just saying it for the camera. <laughs> oh, I could I thought so. So you are now, you are, you, and you've just left your full-time job which yep. was an MP's assistant. Yep. You are now full-time Thrive consultant yep. in the sunny state of Bournemouth. Yeah. Ready to help other emetophobes overcome their phobia too. Yeah. Great, darling, well done. No worries. Took a long time, congratulations. <laughs> Got there in the end. Well done. <laughs> what a journey. <laughs> Good,